thank you everyone for your time tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <laughs> this may be an ongoing thing. I'm sure we all... <laughs> if I don't move, everything will be fine. <laughs> okay. um, so as the um, suggestion implies, Helen and microservices with uh, Kubernetes. First question, can anyone name where I got the title or how I learned to stop worrying about microservices from? Dr. Strange, Strange. Yeah. Okay, so as the name implies, tonight's presentation will be a little bit tongue in cheek. I'm going to poke fun at a couple of developer communities. I hadn't picked Microsoft, but now I know that there's someone in the room from Microsoft. I wish I had known that in advance. Um, and as the slide says, I'm a cloud platform architect from Oracle. Uh, I'm actually based in Canberra, where I deal mainly with the federal government. Um, and I am here on behalf of Oracle, so there's another slide which says that's our safe harbor statement, which um, we'll get there in the end. Basically, so because I'm here from Oracle and I'm going to be talking about a couple of products which Oracle provide, don't base any purchasing decisions on them. That's it. <laughs> they might change. So why should you listen to me as a Java developer? So I'm a cloud platform architect, which means I look at our problems for our customers at a higher level. I was a Java developer for 23 years, so since version 1.02, I still identify as a Java developer. Um, I have previously been accused of being more interested in improving the way we do things rather than actually doing them. Hence now I'm an architect and not a developer. <laughs> yes, I do this cutting code, but I also do have, I like code documentation, I like unit tests, I like looking at the architecture of how big things fit together. So there is life after cutting code, Yes, you do miss it. Yes, you do want to go back to it now and then. And this is one of my opportunities to do that. So I thought I'd start with a joke. Uh, I would put the microphone over there. Um, but I've got an actual joke to follow it up. So there's a group of people sitting around the table on a Friday afternoon, much like this, and it's a project team. And the um, question is asked, do you think God's an engineer? Would God be an engineer? And the civil engineer says, well, obviously he's a civil engineer because God created the world. And that's obviously a feat of civil engineering. And the electrical engineer says, no, no, you're mistaken. Because first, God said, let there be light. And lighting is clearly in the domain of electrical engineering. Then the team scrum master says, no, you've all got it wrong. Because before God could say, let there be light, he created order from chaos. And obviously, an engineering management consultant, project manager, that's where God comes from. And they all wait for the third person, or the final member of the team, who's the software engineer, and they look at her expectantly, just waiting for her to say why God should be a software engineer. And she takes a sip of a drink and calmly says, who do you think made the chaos? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer, of course, is microservices. <laughs> so with that in mind, who's, who's familiar with microservices? Who's com completely confident that they have the best microservices out there? <laughs> <laughs> presentation in the right now. We're going to start with a different question. What is HTTP? Someone throw out a definition. <coughs> Anyone? Come on, guys. This is a room full of developers and you don't know what you're talking about. Are you just shy? Okay, so I'll get you started. It's a request response protocol. runs over TCP IP. Not necessarily TCP IP. <laughs> Right. Public transfer protocol is an application or protocol for distributed collaborative cloud media information systems. HTTP has been blah 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 blah. A more concise way of saying that is RFC 2016. So we have a concrete definition for what HTTP is. We don't have that for microservices. And this is something which can trip us up when we start talking about microservices. So with that in mind, I'm going to go over what I think a microservice is, what the industry has come to think a microservice is, and we'll then be talking about the same thing. So it's basically an architectural pattern or implementation. They've been around for about five years popularly. They have been around in other forms before then. You might have seen SOA implementations or basic SOA objective oriented architecture. Microservice is typically lightweight. So we want, you remember the node thing? That, yeah, okay, so a little executable, dump it there. You want a shell script or something that's got an HTTP endpoint, bam, microservice. We can throw these things around very easily in terms of deployment. You're not looking at a 1.3 gigabyte web logic server, which will do essentially the same thing. Typically, they use REST over HTTP. That's not defined. It is, again, it's not a specification. 
And information systems have a broad range of requirements, so we do sometimes need to send things which aren't plain text human readable. Um, they are implementation agnostic polyglot, so we hear that word a lot, basically means you can have an environment with Node, <coughs> C Sharp, C++, Java, Ruby, Python, Perl, Bash scripts, um, Microsoft Excel, whatever you want that it exposes as an API can be a microservice in and of itself. The key thing is that microservices are discrete, independent components of systems. So discrete means that you can break it off as a chunk. Independent means it doesn't rely on any other component of that system. Those are important things to keep in mind. The micro part is kind of secondary because computers are fast these days, right? So doing my research for this to make sure I was on the right page, and that slide is, we'll get there. Um, I looked at a couple of the titles, and because the screen's playing up, I'll read them out. Um, avoiding microservice mega disasters, uh, why you should never build microservices, and why we do it anyway. Mastering Chaos, a guide to microservices at Netflix. Uh, this is one of my personal favourites. Kill microservices before it is too late by Chad Fowler. So Chad, obviously not too hot on microservices. And 10 tips for failing badly in microservices. There's a lot of negativity out there. So why are there so many cautionary tales? Why are people so anxious about microservices? And a lot of it comes down to the early failures, and I'll point that out. This was early failures. A couple of those videos um, go over a case study at a large computer factor, um, factory organization selling computers. They had a terrible time. Nine minutes to load the home page of the website, they redeveloped it microservices. It was a disaster. They fixed it. They learned a lot of lessons on the way, but the initial attempt was absolutely atrocious. Breaking a monolith. So we're familiar with the term monolith. That's just basically one big execution unit, a program running on a web server, running on an app server, running on an EJB, exposed over goodness knows what. Breaking this apart is computationally expensive because you're no longer talking within the same process when you're making function calls. You're converting them to plain text to make them HTTP, to hit a REST endpoint. Um, you've got a lot of API authorizations and security stuff. It just takes more computing power. You've got a network. All of your requests, instead of going through memory and location and CPU and this nice tight little thing, it might be going over a network to another machine, it might be going to another data center, it might be going to the same machine via a network interface. Hopefully on loopback or something nice and efficient, but you never know. Um, demarcation of responsibilities isn't always clear. So which component is responsible for which function, which team builds which component, how these components work together. If you've ever worked on a large project, you might find two people write the same code to do the same thing, and it might conflict with each other. Um, with microservices, you get two whole programs which might do the same thing. And then your organization needs to collide these together so that your one application can operate consistently. And they all know what they're talking about when they get a user, or a user ID, or an organization unit. Your, your data model becomes very important. Distributed debugging is a nightmare. So who likes stack traces? Um, they are better than the alternative. <laughs> if you have a microservices system and you've got 10 different components and one of them fails, how do you track that failure down? That's a nightmare. Um, one of the places I've worked previously did this by inventing a framework. It was a solar application and they had this thing called profile points. And we'll see a bit more about this later. And the profile points was a way of injecting an idea into every call that you had to make from the web tier to the app tier to the database, back to the app tier, back to the service bus, so that they could see where a transaction had gone. And if something goes wrong, you can pull your logs together and pull out that transaction ID, correlate everything. Performance debugging like this, it's, it's not fun. So we'll take a look at some sample architectures. This is like a monolith. We're all familiar with that. You might have your user, it's the web tier, you've got a load balancer, your HTTP server, it's your app. You've got functions. And down the bottom here, um, we've got identity, security, logging, our cross-cutting concerns in our database over here. So it's a, it's a nice, simple couple of things. When we look at a service-oriented architecture, we've broken this up now. So we've got one, two, three apps, all doing slightly different functions. Our data tier is still over here. It's now accessed by two applications. And in the middle, we've got our enterprise service bus. What, bearing in mind our description of a microservice, what makes this not really microservice-ish? Shared data. Shared data? 
And that's not too bad. There's another thing, shared is the word that we're looking for. What else is shared in that diagram? The process. The process. So you can't really, you're, you're now using this ESB to join the dots together. That is a component of every other single component. They all rely on that one thing. When we're talking true microservices, we don't want something that needs to go with it. We want to swap everything in and out as, as we choose. And that's part of the microservices philosophy. Um, you can call that a microservice. You can develop microservices or call them services that arise by any other name. But this is what we're looking at with a microservice architecture, where you've got these guys talking to each other independently, point to point. No one gets in the middle. If two teams um, decide that they want to create a new function, they do it independent of the administrators of that service bus. There's no getting API tokens if you don't want them. There's no getting authorization. There's no having to deal with one monolithic data model if you don't want to. Good and bad on both of those points. So it sounds like a terrible idea so far because we've got you know you don't have stack traces you don't have this, this all these failures. Why are we going to do this? First one, agility. A component can be swapped out, so you can very quickly, if your monolith breaks in one quarter, <coughs> you're releasing that whole monolith if you need to fix that. Bug fix, whole new update. That's not good. Um, feature releases again. If you're working on a feature and it's ready to go, why do you want to wait on this feature? for the other team to get their accounting or admin function or billing, which is nothing to do with your feature. So you're all familiar with Git and how you can have different branches and the likes. Similar to that, you don't want development on one feature to hold up development on another. Scalability, so in a high, high availability environment, if you're under a lot of load and you're not performing well, scale horizontally, open up more instances of that component, spread them out across the board, and you'll, you know, you'll solve that scalability problem. Neutrality, REST over HTTP, everyone understands that. Node, Rust, Go, PHP, Python. If you have uh, something which is like you've got a data scientist and they say, well, I want to do this in R, but I don't want to be able, you know, held back by you guys with Java and all your boilerplate code, sweet. Do this function in R, give us the results as a JSON object, and everyone's happy. And they can go about doing their job with what they specialize on, and you can do yours. Uh, complexity, so difficult to manage, and again, this is just breaking a large project up into a number of discrete parts, makes them a bit easier to manage. And independence. Who here works for a development house, like a contracting agency, going out developing code for multiple clients? Only one. Okay. So you might not like to hear this, or you might like to hear it, because it cuts both ways. If you've got a project with a massive deadline, and you're not going to meet it, you've now got the option to go to the market and say, I want this bit of code, which gives me this result based on these functions, drop it off with a REST API, job done. Now, this can then be incorporated into your own DevOps cycle and part of your infrastructure, or you can host it in the cloud. So you can now use other people's APIs from the cloud without them messing with your source code. You don't need a third party with visibility of your application source code. They're not pushing any code into your code base, they're just standing up a little chunk, a microservice, which your application now uses. So again, the decision to implement microservices is often organizational or operational rather than technological or, or technical. So they don't perform that much better, but they do make life easier in some ways. Why the recent interest? So recently we've had, like computers got faster, networks are more capable, data centers are more um, capable. We've got more languages and more platforms to choose from. We've got specialist languages and niche languages. Uh, Elastic and cloud computing has come along and we can very rapidly deploy units of code using CI and CD tool chains. Um, scale of applications have increased. They've gotten much bigger. You look at Facebook. You can tell me 20 years ago, you'd have something in your pocket that connects 500 million people and it runs on your phone. And you can find, you can message any one of those 500 million people. This is truly, this is how engineering um, challenges are met by the private sector. Um, Netflix, again, heavily involved with microservices. They had their own problems, like in the early days, but again, they've worked out coping strategies and coping mechanisms to make their app scale and the functionality scale as well. Um, nomadic developer workforce, so average career for a developer, 18 months, two years, and then they might move jobs, they might move to a different project team, that 
project might finish, the developers go within what the BAU pays or the business as usual, you've got to support that application. Um, so you don't actually always have the team to make those changes to that particular component. It's a bit of a problem for a lot of businesses and especially like federal government where I spend a lot of time. And technology advances in tooling like Docker makes discrete components, you may call them containers, but everyone uses Docker. Um, it makes it more man easier to manage uh, in our Is there a train line above? <laughs> <laughs> so we can now take, when we're talking about our deploying of um, our units, our microservice units, Docker containerizes and wraps it up nicely. It gives us a defined interface so that we can put this into systems all over the place. Is Java a little late to the party on this one? So we we are, like, I mean, the Java developer community has 12 million developers. We're not always on the cutting edge. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, my, Node.js loves microservices because they've got that particular niche. You go to a learn how to program site, it's Node.js. Here, you can put Hello World in two lines. Woohoo! Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you scale that? Can you do that in a multi-threaded environment? Can you do that with what APIs have you got for XML processing? What you know, build tool, CICD? Is that certified to run on your enterprise grade hardware? None of that. Okay, so Node was great for getting microservices started. And that niche case where you've just got, I want to format a date into a you know, particular string, microservice, bang, job done. There's a great um, JSON test time thing. It just gives you the current time in a JSON string. That kind of thing is a microservice is great. Java hasn't typically made it played in that field. We're seen as heavyweight because we like app servers, Glassfish, Tomcat, uh, WebLogic, WebSphere, we've got a bunch of really great um, app containers, effectively, which will manage our applications. And they're pretty big. WebLogic, 1.3 gigabytes. You can deploy WebLogic as a microservice, just have enough bandwidth for it and enough disk, and that's fine. You can treat it as a microservice. You can put it in a Docker container. Not really seen as the way to go. Um, because Java has a strong SOA background, so we've got our ESBs and message queues and all the rest of that, a lot of the service-based development in Java has been using message buses. So we've got our we solved this problem in a different way. And you know, a lot of the apps, like frameworks like Spring Boot, are getting seen as a little bit heavyweight, a little bit generic, a little bit multi-purpose. So we're not really in the microservices space. And the last reason is we have better alternatives. So here's a list of functions which Docker provides. Um, encapsulation of dependencies, we've got a Docker image. Well, we put those in jar files and wall files and ear files, and then we give them to the DevOps guys, they run it up on the server. Platform independence, I mean, you've got a Docker daemon per kernel, so you've got the Linux kernel, you can run all of your Linux Docker images, regardless of the distribution. Well, for decades, we've had JVMs running on HP UX and Solaris and dead operating systems and Windows and Mac OS. So we've already solved that problem. Um, repository of elements, of artifacts. So you've got the Docker registry. Well, we've had major repositories for years. These things which Docker are bringing in and saying, wow, these are great new features. All the Java developers are like, we did that ages ago. Why is this new to us? The whole Docker, you know, everybody wants build once, deploy anywhere. That's, that's a Java philosophy. Um, which actually means we should play nicely with that Docker mentality because we're familiar with the concepts. Um, so again, the decision, you know we've got all these great technologies, is often going to be organisational. So you might find yourself in a position where someone says, hey, dev team, I need you to write me a microservice. Um, don't argue with them. You might want to. I mean, I did originally. I had people on projects I was working on say, hey, we should do a microservice architect. And I was like, no, please don't. Bad things lie that way. And they saw reason in the end we didn't because that application wasn't a use case for it. There will be many use cases where microservices is a great way to go. The reason is we want to adopt microservices is to coordinate nicely with our DevOps team and our operations staff. Um, you've got good object-oriented paradigm with microservices, separation of concerns, encapsulation. These are good OO practices. We endorse those as Java developers. Um, retain control of the execution environment. If you want to, please don't do this. You can then say, okay, look, I'm going to give you a Docker container with Java 7 in it, and that's it. You don't need to know what's inside. You are now responsible for that JVM. That Java 7, you need to make sure that it remains patched and up to date, and every time it gets deployed, you are taking care of the patching of your system components. If you've got a good operations team, let them do it. 
if you're just a one person show and you have to take it on, take it on. And this is a way that you can actually do that with more certainty. So you're not relying on an ops guy calling up on the phone saying, I'm getting a stack trace, I don't even know what it means. Why is your Java broken? Because they've gone to version nine instead of version seven and didn't tell you. Um, right, once deploy anywhere, so that sounds familiar. And we wanted to displace those pesky Python devs one component at a time. And I joke about that, but there is anecdotal evidence that at Netflix, common pattern, write a microservice in Python, deploy it to production, do a little bit of testing, sweet, it works. Full scale in production, crashes, rewrite in Java. <laughs> <laughs> I am, like, I'm the Java guy, I program in a friendly room. <laughs> Python executes, it does things well, it does things nicely. When you look at the Java platform and how it's evolved and how it is certified by Oracle to run on Solaris or Red Hat Enterprise Linux or Windows 9, it is tested more than you would imagine. The testing and compatibility kit for other builds of Java, like OpenJDK to get the Java ticket of approval, is hundreds of thousands of tests. Like this is a rigorously tested, developed platform. It's not an open source little, hey, I made a programming language by copying it out of a browser and running it as a console. It's not that. There is a place for that in the world, and we're, you know, honestly there are more Node developers at Oracle in the offices I visit than there are Java developers, but I'm trying to fix that. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, the, um, we're hiring. Um, the, the Python, with all those small microservices, they are great. If they start failing, if they don't work, you can pop them out, replace it with a Java microservice. You've got that assurance of the, you know, the good VM. Right, so the story so far, how we've actually been doing microservices with Java up until now. Servlets, anyone written a servlet? Stick it in that container. I don't need to care about interfaces and all the rest. It's port 80. Like, what more do I need to worry about? It's port 80, HTTP. Servlets are great. EJBs. Anyone worked with an EJB? Yeah. In a couple of hands. Enterprise Java. Look, well, no, I get it. I didn't work for EJBs for the first like 15 years of my Java career because I didn't need to. Uh, I won't ask who's used Corva because um, that's that's way back in the past. Um, and EJB. They will be loaded into an app server or something and they handle inter-process communication. So people talk generically of RPC, remote procedure calls. EJBs did that. And it was just as if you're calling a Java method on another machine. You know, or it might be on the same machine, it might be in the same VM. You don't know, you don't care. You've got service discovery algorithms which will go out and find where that endpoint should end up. And it will just call that code. The result you get back is a Java object. There's none of this rest, there's no um, unpacking parameters, marshalling and unmarshalling, you just get a Java object back. It's brilliant. It doesn't play nicely with the other kids, so it's non polyglot. You know, the, the native interfaces to all the other languages get a little bit complicated. Um, app frameworks, again, ops dependent. And then my favourite is the one down the bottom where it's just like Java and Genie and Jax RS and, you know, with a groovy maybe putting some struts, a whole bunch of frameworks, and then just like give it to some poor soul to maintain for the rest of their career. Um, it's not a good way to live. But there must be a better way, and that would be Pulidum, which is an open source microservices framework for Java brought to you by Oracle. And that's the first line of that slide, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, lightweight modular, we've got two programming models, Helidon SE and Helidon MP. There's a slight distinction between the two of them, like a square is a rectangle, they're pretty much the same thing. We've got a uh, web server, we've got security, health checks, metrics, uh, distributed tracing built into this single platform. The only requirements you have are Java 8 or later, maybe 3.5, and if you want to containerize it, you don't need to, but if you want to put it in a container, then you just need Docker 1802 or, or Kubernetes 174. Again, version numbers, not that interested, just be kind of up to date and it'll work. We've got some supporting tools like Grafana, which is a dashboard um, tool, zip computer distributed tracing, Oracle Engine for Kubernetes, which is how we manage our Kubernetes clusters. But we'll get onto Kubernetes towards the tail end of this presentation. If you want to create a setup, who's used Maven before? Well, so many more hands, this is good. So, 
don't like servers, do like Maven. That's how you do it. You've just got an archetype. Um, the MP version is slightly um, truncated, so there's dot, dot, dot. It's all of these different archetype things. Bang, that gives you a project on your file system. We've got two programming models. SE is the core implementation, so standard edition. Uh, you create a web server, you build a route for it, set the path, and you send hello world. Dot build, creates it, dot start, to a programming model. That gives you a web server which will send a hello world to the output. On the other side of NP, you've got the micro profile APIs, which are annotations based around JAXRS, which is the Java RESTful web services uh, project. And again, add a couple of annotations to a POJO, and you now have a microservice which is ready to go. The web server is based on Netty, which means that it's better than Jetty because it does um, not just HTTP, it does TCP and UDP, it has uh, handlers for large file transfers, it does binaries really well, so you're not restricted to REST, so you can go above and beyond the standard uh, server REST output. Um, the config, read from multiple places, class loaded, have it on the file system, have it in a properties file. If your config changes, Peloton will read that change and reincorporate it into your application while it's running, which is a handy feature. We've got security features for you know, tying down those services and propagating IDs through different calls. A couple of models there, you can do it with a shared secret file, you can do it by deferring to the container or calling out IDCS, which is a, an Oracle Cloud hosted identity provider, a bunch of other options there for you. The MP components, so the second programming model, brings a bit more to the party. So we're talking about JAXRS support. So this will increase the distribution size a little bit, but it gives you that JAXRS annotate your POGO, get a REST service call out, context and dependency injections, um, JSONP, which is an API for process and JSON. Anyone work with Stacks and ROM back in the day? <coughs> mm, a little bit. So Stacks and ROM were a streaming API for XML, and DOM was the domain document object model, which was basically how you build an object and then you get XML out the end because no one wants to be sitting there doing string builder dot depends, bean dot get name, string builder dot depend, and all of that. So this takes care of the bit of boilerplate for you. And that's how you make it go. Made in package, that'll create your uh, jar in your target folder, and you run that jar and then you call curl, which of course, you know, in the Unix system. Does, um, the oh, does Windows have curl built in yet? Yep. Oh, sweet. Um, is that with the bash that they embedded? Yeah. Cool. Uh, but there's some more stuff coming where that'll just run natively out of the box. Too. Nice. Um, Localhost 8080 grid, and that gives you your hello world. So, a trivial example, but even if this was a multiple jar thing climbing together, that's how you get a web service. That's all your ops guys need to know to run that. Moving on, surviving microservice failures or don't be on the hill. Um, does anyone know the acronym MRLS? MRLS. You probably won't because it's that. It's a multiple rocket launch system. All <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. When the, when the picture cleans up, it'll look a whole lot more impressive. Um, multiple rocket launch system. I had a friend in the army and she was she liked tanks. They were really interesting to her, even after years in the army, when a tank drove past the window, she'd still get up and check it out. People thought she was crazy. But she told me one day about this MRLS beast, and she said it's just like an Iron Man, where at the start it's got that Jericho missile system and it takes up these demonstrating at the Department of Defense and the rockets fly out and they hit the side of the mountain and there's this massive explosion, dust everywhere and the whole mountain just disappears and crumbles into dust. And she said they're just like that. I'm like, really? So if you're on the hill, she's like, yeah, game over. I'm like, so how do, you, how do you counter that? You're out there with your squad of soldiers and you're like, you come up against one of these. What do you do? Right. She's like, don't be on the hill. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes perfect sense in hindsight. So you survive microservice failures by not failing. And I know it sounds good, right? But when a microservice fails, that's it. It's game over. Like, it's not really, you know, switch it off and start again. So what we need to do is build in resilience to our applications. Pre-deployment, we've got options. Testing. Um, all of your tests are effectively unit tests now. 
and they're unit tests because your application is not really an application, it's a component of another application. You don't know what data someone's going to hand you. You don't know what parameters if they'll mess them up. If uh, you're expecting um, you know, a 1K payload and you get a 10 gig payload, what do you do? Will you even survive that? You don't know. Anyone could be calling your endpoint with anything. The service upstream gets into a tight loop and starts hammering your service. How do you deal with that? There's a lot of there's a lot more moving parts. Um, scalability, you're going to need to have your, your testing performance and capacity tested. Your dependency matrix is now the cross product of all of the services if they can call each other. I'll put that caveat in there because you can put API management in front of it, limit access, put security in front of it, limit access. Is that really microservices now? You're getting away from a little bit of this like, hey, everyone come to the party and we can all throw our services and play together. You're now having an access control list which is restricting your application and becomes another dependency. Remember the little code example at the start? Documentation. Hmm. You've now got two levels. You've got your internal documentation. You now need to provide API documentation to anyone who's consuming your service. So they know what you get back, what, what you'll get to give them back. They need to know if there are side effects of calling that service. They need to know if it's scalable, thread safe, or goodness knows what. Please, it should be thread safe. Um, and after deployment, we'll take a look at a couple of things because we've only got so many minutes to go through the rest of the presentation. Tracing, metrics, and health check. Uh, features which Himden can bring to the party for zero cost, uh, other than a Maven dependency. Is that thing you saw before? We've now taken out our logging and put it down to a distributed tracing unit in the uh, somewhere in the cloud. We don't know, so let's go back to that. We don't know who's called what to where. So that's those orange lines are just like web service and log, hey, I've got an HTTP request. This guy will say, hey, they want to look at their list of accounts. This guy will say, hey, they want to look up their user ID. You don't know what's going on. All you get is discrete logs. With tracing and distributed tracing in particular, what we do is we take a client which makes a call. We use a declaration pattern where we inject the user ID into that call. It goes through the HTTP request. Whatever's receiving it on the other end, will then say, oh, that came from this guy. When I log anything for this call, I've got that user ID, or I've got that session context, or I've got that transaction ID. And then you'll go off and process the rest of the call. Again, with the trans. Zipkin is a tracing utility that we use within Hilden. It's an open source product. Again, the nice thing about Zipkin is it works with Go, Ruby, Java, uh, Python, C Sharp, all of these other languages, there are different bindings out there, there are libraries which implement the tracing. So you can now, thanks to standardization, handle that tracing of information discreetly, invisibly, it's um, invisible to the user. You just decorate your web server and say, I'm using this open tracing API, hand this field to the next guy in the chain. And that's what you get out. So you, you won't be able to read that, but you've got components names over on the left, and then for each component name, you've got the call and how much time it's spent, if you've used a profiler in Java, you'll be familiar with that in method breakdowns. I mean, we're now talking API calls. Um, metrics. Metrics are really cool. They are user-definable. Uh, you can just get a, a resource map effect, you've got a hash table, and you can start modifying it. You can analyze your load, so have a hit counter. We've got a stand-based implementation, so we can use uh, metrics with Prometheus, which is an open source tool. Provides you this dashboard that you can see over on the right and you can do alerting for you in an open source, multi-platform method. Why do we need metrics? So that you can tell how your partitioning of services is working out. You can tell if one component is a lot more popular than another component, if one's running slower, and then you can drill down into those components. Because remember, we've got all these things all over the place, and you can see how they're doing. You can view their heap usage, their memory. If you've got a heap on a JVM that's growing and growing and growing and growing, you want to tag that to be shut down and restarted before that heap gets consumed. You want to do that. And the way we do that is with things like metrics and health checks. That's an example of code to create metrics. Um, I hope it's clearer than the example at the start of the uh, Again, no documentation, we lose points, but try to fit it on one slide. And we're basically using a little bit of uh, method references to get access and inject them into the chain. And then whenever this is called, it'll increase that access counter and then 
go to the next step in the chain. So you can chain multiple uh, lifecycle stages in your Helen web server. Right, so we look at the memory usage, blocking I.O., downstream failures. You can adapt your load balancing strategy. Um, you can look at your partition strategy. So if you've got multiple microservices, uh, partitioning with databases breaks storage up. If you've got an alphabet worth of you know, people's names, all the A's go in this box, all the B's go in this box, all the C's go in this box. Your microservices, when they're serving requests, you might want to partition by geography. So during these hours, I'm going to have a microservice which is specific to India, and one which is specific to Australia, and one which is specific to Canada and the US, and you might want to have a look at which ones are being used more. So this isn't just your overall application usage, you're drilling down into how you set these up. And if you're finding you're getting more traffic to the Canada server or service, you can get that from your metrics on the little dashboard and update your partitioning strategy accordingly. Health checks, which is leading right into our next point because they tie up so nicely. Um, how do you know your microservice has failed? Anyone? When someone yells at you. When someone yells at you. You hope to get to it. Remember, don't be on the hill. You want to know your microservice has failed before you actually before it actually fails. Um, there are a couple of ways of doing this. Is it responding? Is the process right? Is it responding with the right thing? Like if it's responding and it's just giving you a 404 every time, that's no good. If it's responding and it's giving you a 200 but there's no message payload, again, that's no good. If it's not responding, is it because it's timed out? Is it because the process isn't running? There's all kinds of causes for that. Health checks will give you a Again, a defined, we're talking a lot about standards here, we're giving you a defined endpoint which other tools can understand. And the reason we need other tools is because we're now moving on to Kubernetes. And I'll ask the question again, who's used Kubernetes? One, two, three, four, great. So I can say anything I like about it and you guys will take me on word. Um, it's a container orchestration. So it's the brains behind all those scaling clusters. And it's a product which came out of Google originally, and it was managing their container system, which was called Borg, kind of nicely. Uh, deploy your containers, start and stop them. Why would you stop them? Because they failed their health check. Okay? So when we're talking about um, self-healing, you need a system around it to know that something's gone down. So we, like, when someone yells at you, you go, oh, I'll restart the process. I'll show it, I'll restart it. When your monitoring app says it's gone down, it's already too late. When we talk about self-healing, we need a system wrapped around our deployments to take care of it. So if a service goes down, it will stand up another one in its place like that. Instantaneously or preemptively. That's the goal. And we do this with our monitoring and custom health checks. So Kubernetes, as I said, came out of Google. It's an open source project now. That's how you define your Kubernetes clusters and deployments and objects with a YAML file. It doesn't need to be YAML. There are also, like <coughs> Oracle, provide a certified Kubernetes implementation. And that means you get a web browser and you just get to click through lists and you can watch it in real time. When you've got the open source version, type in kubectl this, deploy, change that, and it works and it's great. And if you're familiar with that, all well and good. If you've got a team of ops people and they're not quite up to skill with that, or if you're not wanting to get into that level of familiarity with Kubernetes, get a managed service. Google will provide one for their Google Cloud platform. Do Microsoft, Microsoft have one in Azure? And here's the best part. Once it's certified, you can take it anyway. You're not happy with the Oracle Cloud? I mean, why would you not be happy with the Oracle Cloud? Put it in Azure. You're not happy with Azure? Put it in the Oracle Cloud. You're not happy with either of those? You <laughs> <laughs> made up your list. <laughs> so some of the concepts behind Kubernetes. I should have asked if there's anyone from Amazon in the room. No, you all look too smart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this has been important too. Um, so Kubernetes is based around a cluster, which is a group of computers. Within there, you'll have a master node, uh, which has these commands, which do the scheduling, and it's got the API endpoint so that you can drive it by REST. You'll then have a bunch of nodes, and a node is effectively equivalent to a computer. It doesn't need to be a physical device, but your nodes will then have 
the little kublet, which is the engine which runs your Kubernetes commands, and then it will have a number of pods, and these pods can be interconnected and they can talk to each other. The pod is the deployable unit. It will contain one or more containers. They share networks, they share volumes. They're transient, so they come and go. Remember, we're now talking about services which might die, so be prepared for that. Make everything stateless. It's going to go away. Uh, replica sets will then give you three copies of that pod. Or if you change your configuration, say, I now want five copies, because we're about to get hit by the Black Friday sale, it'll spin up five copies. That's all you need to do. You are not there typing in, deploy another pod, deploy another pod, oh, map that subnet to this, route that subnet through there. You don't need to do that. You do it declaratively once, and then you just hit the go button. A deployment is a description file, so it'll be deployment.yaml, and that defines the containers, environment variables, your data volumes, the number of replicas. Remember, data volumes and storage is now abstracted, so it's a slightly different world. You're now picking up copies of these applications and their containers and shipping them around. If they've got dependencies like network traffic and all the rest, you've now got a bunch of Kubernetes abstractions which wrap around the Docker abstractions, which wrap around our Java abstractions, which wrap around, eventually you get to a network or a disk somewhere, like fingers crossed. But it all seems to work very well. Um, services uh, facilitate your inter-pod communication. So we saw we get other uh, two pods and they might want to talk to each other. Services are Kubernetes concepts which expose those um, components or those containers to each other. And we do static IP addresses, DS, DNS name, the proxy to pod traffic, load balancing, the session affinity. Now this is within the cluster. So you might have a load balancer for your HTTP server, which then puts it into your, H your Kubernetes cluster for an ingress rule. And then Kubernetes will lo load balance all those pods in the middle. And that's great, because you can't. You have no way of knowing how many replica sets you've got set up. And once you've got a pod, it doesn't know much about the outside world either, because there's all these abstractions which give us this scalability that the cluster can control. So how are we going to code to this when everything's an abstraction? We've got the internal proxy, so that exposes these containers that we're running to the rest of the network. Um, pods will come and go. Just like you have to be like stateless in your operation. You have to be prepared for a pod to be killed without you issuing a command. If a health check says that looks dodgy, it's gone. So that pod will go away. So if you're um, relying on transactional certainty, you might run into a couple of issues that you can manage, but it makes their life a bit harder. The services are exposed to dynamic internal DNS. That means Kubernetes now controls your DNS, which means you code to a host name. That's really cool. So if you've got a bunch of pods that want to talk to each other, you just code to a DNS name and Kubernetes will define that, okay, I know that this service has this DNS name and I know it's running over here, does the network routing for you. If that service moves to another node, Kubernetes knows where it is, you don't need to. So you end up coding to host names a lot and letting the underlying DNS do the work for you. You can bend the rules, so you can do a replica set of size one, so you get a singleton. You can have a single container, there's a Kubernetes operator for web logic, so you can just write your server, stick it in web logic, put it in a container, and then throw that over the fence and say, look, I am now running web logic in Kubernetes. You want to stop that, start that, you can do all of that. The Kubernetes has control over that, so your ops team have control over the deployment, and they, all they need to know is that one tool, Kubernetes. They don't need to be web logic, web sphere, JBoss, um, any of that. Right. So summarizing, microservices are still terrible, but we can do them better. Like we've got, we've got challenges. Um, when, they, when they work well, they work really well. Java brings a lot to the party here. We've got an enterprise-grade virtual machine which runs in a certified manner on a number of platforms. This gives you certainty to your customers and it gives you certainty you know, to your employers when they say, look, is this going to be supported when Windows bring out a new operating system? Yes. Is this an open source you know, project where if there's a security vulnerability and we need to patch it, it's going to be six months that we're exposed to the zero day exploit? No. Because you've got the backing of a large multinational bringing the language platform and also the Heladen um, framework to the market. Um, Heladen is supported if you have a WebLogic license. So the guys who write WebLogic, that giant monolith of an application server, 
also low volume. It's their alternative, WebLogic Lite. Um, if you have a supported WebLogic license, you will get Oracle commercial grade support for your Helen deployments. That's pretty cool. There are not many open source implementations of frameworks that come with that kind of degree of certainty. So if you've got a particularly anxious um, environment that you're working in, having that support license for some customers is very attractive. To be fair, if you have WebLogic, you probably put everything in WebLogic anyway, wouldn't you? Um, Standards-based APIs and tooling in a great system across cutting the center. So this goes back to our tracing, um, Prometheus, Zipkin tracing, all of these services. MicroProfile is in itself a standard uh, maintained by the Eclipse Foundation, which guarantees that Java now plays nicely with so many other platforms so that we can sit into a truly polyglot landscape. This is great for you as a Java developer because it gets you access to environments where you might previously have been excluded because you know we can't, our systems can't talk. Um, and our mature CI CD pipeline adapts nicely to automated deployments and the tooling around Kubernetes. That's time. So that's about 46 minutes of me talking. And I will now throw it open to questions from the audience. I'll make one request. Please don't ask me anything you can do. So if you want to know how the Kubernetes command line parameters work, don't do that. If you want to ask me where Oracle's going to Java or Heliden or what it's like to work in Canberra, don't ask. support later. The funny thing is, like, Helen should have been called Noah's Ark, because everything's going two by two. You've got two tracing, and you've got SE and NP, the microprofile. Um, it may be available. It's an open source project, so if you're keen for it, you can make a contribution yourself. Um, or hopefully just, like, bring it up on the forums. So, I, one thing I didn't mention, the website, heliden.io, is the place you go to, or if you just Google Heliden. Uh, it is an open source project, so if you want to improve it, you have every ability to do that. If you want to get on the email to the guys who are driving it and give them a hard time and say, why don't you support Gradle? Oracle product management analysis, and I can say this from inside the company, I know everyone says, oh, Oracle doesn't listen, they do what they want, blah, blah, blah. It's not actually the case. The whole move is that, uh, you know, open JDK, like seriously, what more do you guys want? We took the whole platform and said, hey, open source guys, get involved, get on board make it a better place for our developers to be more productive. So with Helen, I've got email addresses for the guys who are actually delivering it, so grab a card from me at the end of the presentation. Uh, and that goes for anyone. If anyone does want to get into the Helen developers, I will offer an inside channel. I'm not going to offer this to the guys in Sydney tomorrow. They can find their own way on the web, um, just because I like Melbourne more. And we do actually take on board you know, community feedback, so great is a good question. Anything else? Yes, Tom. I apologise if you can me for this, but I can't remember. Uh, so does, can you swap out Zipkin for any other future tracing? Um, okay, so the way we do that is with the open tracing API. So anything which is open tracing compliant can be swapped out, so you don't need to have Zipkin as your collector. Um, Zipkin's pretty cool because it collects over HTTP or a couple of methods including a Kafka stream, stream. So if you're doing a lot of streaming data analytics, Kafka's a really good place to go for that. So Zipkin's kind of good. But anything which uses the open tracing API, which is part of the micro profile uh, specification from the Eclipse Foundation, will be compatible. Okay, yeah, we've got some like internal drop widget um, solution where we've just swapped out our Zipkin with something else. Um, okay. Two questions. First was uh, your definition of microservices. You, uh, you said uh, one of the main reasons why that diagram is not microservices is because it had a, a shared service bus. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you don't think it's a microservice system when they're all dropping events with like a, a message queue, which is pretty much the same thing? Pretty much, yeah, message queue would be similar. Um, you're relying on that message queue. If you have like a really tiny discrete message queue, which is a component, that's a slightly different case. When we're talking enterprise service buses, 
that is usually shared by a number of different systems as well. So you don't have control over that as part of your one application. There right. will be other systems which will interact with it. So it's now an external dependency. Yeah, like a, like a, like basically a high speed bus that's on pipe so it yes. message like a, your instead of using HTTP, it's just a common message format which yep. gets broadcast all. Yeah, and so I mean Netty, the, the front end of the field on, on that does accept messaging format like JMS to mm -hmm. receive transactions. So it plays nicely in that environment. So if you do have a service bus. Your microservices can play nicely with it. It's really semantics that we're arguing here now. Um, but typically, you'd like it not to have one as a component which is common to your system and shared with other systems. It's a bit of a herb smell, I guess. And the other question was regarding using something like WebLogic or uh, I think WebLogic is an example yep. we, we could use. If you're going to go to the trouble of breaking down a model to microservices and, and setting up this sort of you know, cluster infrastructure, would you would you keep a big app server? Or app no, app? personally I wouldn't. Um, the reason you keep WebLogic is, or Tomcat or Glassfish or any of those app servers, is if they provide functionality which you're relying on in your application. That's going to be things like resources, uh, dependency injection of databases, JNDI for accessing other resources which you know, pertain to that application. If you can get away with it, microservices are not really. That said, if you are using those things, the Kubernetes operator for WebLogic means you can containerize it, run it in that environment where things are being stood up automatically and brought down automatically. It's going to be a 1.3 gig download for the first time it goes to that node. When you stop and start it, you're still you're only stopping and starting the image, so it still operates as it can operate as a microservice. It's just not very micro. So Helen comes to give you the bare minimum functionality, expose my endpoint, here's my web server, I know how to kind of get to a database, I've got JDBC and I can route out a network, that's cool, that's enough for me. Um, if you want to hook into LDAP servers and all the rest of that, it's possible, but again, that's it's courses for courses. Personally, I'm going to stick in the web logic world for as long as I can, I think. I mean, for years, I like to be able to see the reset switch on the computer that I was coding on. I think that's, yeah. that's a nice thing. Like, when it all goes wrong, you can hit the reset button. And, um, like, Cloud Native is a, it's a, it's a real game changer. Um, and it's changing the way that we work as developers. And we've got two choices stay in the dark and hide from it, or look at it and then ridicule it because you realize you've got better ways to do it yourself. Any more questions? So is that, um, is that a, some kind of getaway? It's a getaway with a reason where it will route your... Um, yeah. Okay, so with Helidon, not really. You're going to expose an interface on the embedded web server, and that's it. So we'll run up a process which exposes a port, so port 80. Um, you just configure that in the configuration file. When we start looking at Kubernetes, which runs multiple instances of that jar file, then it does all of the, the gateways and the proxy, and that, that generates your network diagram declaratively. So Kubernetes will do it. So Kubernetes will do the, the scaling and the aggregation and the load balancing. Helidon will just give you a single web server, however it's configured, usually HTTP on port 80, and that's how your app gets out to the rest of the world. So it provides the web server function for you. Uh, so so you, you're talking about the load balancing? Uh, yeah. Because I was wondering like, if you have several different Fabulous microservices and yep. and um, other clients, and I, I want to access that one. Yep. So, what I've seen is that there is a, a, a like service discovery. Yeah. Yes. With Helidon, not so much. What we do with Helidon, if you want to do the service discovery, is we start using frameworks like Kubernetes, and Kubernetes will you write up a de declarative file which says, "This is my app. It's composed of the following services." This is how they relate to each other. This is my load balancing strategy. This is why you end up on that node there. And that's, that's how you do that. So when you write a, a, a microservice in Helidon, you have a single, usually a single endpoint. You have an HTTP GET request, for example. And that's its only, that's all it knows about the world. It just receives traffic. Um, and then you've got that other layer on top, which does the routing to the actual microservice analogy. Now that I've said that, you can make a mess of it however you <laughs> you can, you can, this is one of the nice things. You can put wrappers around it, you can put abstractions, you can use other libraries, you can use different distribution and deployment things. 
This is why we're developers. We weren't happy with what was in the marketplace, so we went out and we built our own. And the, the power of something like a little framework like this is how much you can do with it, because you can get right down into the innards and, um, and tweak it and incorporate it. It's amazing dependency. If you've got a project which is already doing a bunch of stuff, all you need to make that now expose a microservice API is incorporate that Maven jar and annotate one of your projos, bang, and it's, it's off there and running. So, yeah. How does this compare with something like Spring Boot or Microball? Okay, Spring Boot is a little more heavyweight. Um, anyone use JLink? No, no idea. So JLink is the Java linker, it's fairly new. Um, I think it came out in Java 9 modules. And what that basically allows you to do is take a look at your Java uh, deployment and give you in the jar file only the libraries and dependencies you require to operate. So it really compacts the size of your distribution. Um, Spring Boot carries with it a bunch of uh, jars and functionality which is around applications. This is more just like I just want a single interface out to my um, to the rest of the world being that Netty server. So Spring Boot carries more with it. Uh, you can do microservices with Boot, of course. You can containerize them, dockerize them. That's great. Spring Boot, I don't think, has the same distributed tracing and uh, on the web server and everything come together. But the thing that Heladin gives you is that micro profile from the Eclipse Foundation, and it plums it all together nicely for you so that it knows how to get those tracing, um, the decorated tracing variables off that request and then pass them on to the next server server in the chain. And there is, there is a, I think there's actually, if you Google Heldon versus Spring Boot, you'll see a comparison. You mentioned that it has JMS support. Can it still do that sort of distributed tracing if you're using MS? Yes. Yeah. Because it's using um, the web API uses that decorator mm -hmm. um, pattern. So basically, you insert it into the chain and say, before you send this request to the next chain, add this as a parameter, and it does it all for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it might be on, on the internet. Because you're here. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so, um, say, say, you, say you got like, um, an application that grows over time, mm -hmm. and you say, okay, well, I don't know how the decision would be made, but it's got to be developed by uh, using a microservice architecture. Yep. So, first of all, like, if, if, you did, if you design several microservices, would you need uh, independent database, as in two different like, schema, or how, how would you go about? Oh, it's not possible. Yeah. Okay, so you can have a single database. Mm -hmm. You can have one database per microservice. Mm -hmm. Very often, you'll be taking, you will have shared data objects. So the, the classic examples of those, like, I want to buy a PC, so I want to get an image of the PC, so I get that from this database, but I need the part number, and that comes from this catalog of parts, so there's that linking. So a lot of that data ends up in the one data model, which often ends up in the one database. Mm -hmm. When it gets to another service over here, which is like, I'm going to send this uh, an invoice to the, the shipping company or whatever, and all that needs to know about is addresses and how to format them correctly, that's its data source. It doesn't need a connection to the rest of the data model. So it is possible to do it both ways. Both ways. Yeah. yeah. And, and you can have a hybrid, so you can have some components sharing the database, and a data model, and other components which are just a discrete little, this is off on the side. Um, simple things like, I want to look up a postcode. Like, is this a valid postcode? Is this a valid phone number? Is this a valid email address? All those little kind of, like, I don't want to write another function. I put this in my jar, I put this in my source code. So now I've got 10 jars with functions which check to see if it's a valid email address. And they might do it in three different ways. One might actually call out to, an to the DNS to see if the thing exists and all the rest of that. Just have a little microservice over here. This is how we validate discrete addresses or postal addresses. Doesn't need to know this data model, you don't come it up. So, so that, that would go like this, uh, this uh, single microservice would come in our, in our case, like as a um, Kubernetes yep. with, with a Helidon kind of yep. container. Yep. And the Kubernetes and that pod will know, the Kubernetes will tell that pod how it connects to the other pods. So it will handle the, the network and the DNS. Best part as a developer, you don't need to worry about it. You just say to the operations people who are running that Helen, uh, the Kubernetes cluster, these are the services that need to talk to each other. 
when I use this DNS name, this is the service I want to get to. And they just map that out declaratively in that config file, and off it goes. Kubernetes, by the way, if you want to learn it, give yourself a week, two weeks. It's bigger than it looks. There's, there's a lot of information. It's got a lot of capabilities. There's a lot of abstractions. Fortunately, Google have put a lot of good information out there on the internet. The, the website's got a lot of documentation, and there's a whole bunch of good YouTube videos. So it's worth getting your head around, even if you never use it. And you will also find a lot more operations people talking about Docker and why they love Docker so much. Any more questions? I've got a question, but if anyone wants to ask for that. Just, good. Just got a plus two question. So this uh, Helidon framework is basically for Java. Yes. Right. But doesn't it go against the definition of microservices where you have the liberty of choosing the language of your choice and distributing it? Not really. Because when we say we've got the liberty of choosing a language, what we're bringing is the ability for a Java program to interact with other programs by providing that tracing API. So we're using standards underneath. We're using REST, HTTP, the Open Tracing API to make sure that the Java programs can work with the Go programs and the Ruby programs and all the other programs. Because there's going to be, um, if we go on the Zipkin site, um, or even just the Open Tracing, they'll have, these are the languages that we know to support this protocol. So as long as your language is one of those languages, you'll interoperate. So Helium is a Java implementation of a micro-profile standard. Um, micro-profile is an Eclipse Foundation thing, so it's a collection of specifications, which basically allow different languages to interoperate seamlessly. You can have all your analytics and metrics from all the microservices, not just Java-based. Yeah, from all the other microservices, yeah. That's and they all work out, and they, the tracing is handled, and the health checks. When you expose a health check in Kubernetes, they have an actual format. They say, this is how we interpret a health check. So as long as your Ruby and your Go and your Java and your Visual C Sharp Sharp Plus Plus whatever, as long as they're exposing that same health check, the system as a whole will work together. Awesome. So we are just thanks, thanks a lot, Stephen, for uh, amazing talk.